14 well-preserved skeletons were uncovered here. Bodies of evidence believed to be victims of the Black Death. What's your gut feeling, that there are more? There are more bodies? Yeah, I should think so. In the autumn of 1347, a fleet of Genoese trading ships sailed into the Sicilian port of Messina. What they carried would change the world forever. Not gold, not silk, but death itself. Within weeks, entire streets were silent. By the time the wave had passed, between 50 and 60% of Europe's population, roughly 25 to 30 million people, were dead, according to historian Ole Benedictao, 2021. For centuries, historians argued about where this nightmare began. Was it born in the crowded cities of China, among the nomads of the Eurasian steppe, or in the ports of the Black Sea? The truth lay hidden for more than 680 years, until a forgotten cemetery in the mountains of Central Asia yielded a secret only modern science could unlock. And here's the twist. The Black Death didn't begin in Europe, or even in the places most scholars suspected. It began with a handful of graves, etched with a single chilling word, pestilence. What you're about to hear is the true origin story of the most infamous pandemic in human history. Pieced together from 19th century archeology, span medieval trade records, and cutting edge ancient DNA research. It's a story that begins not in a plague pit, but on the sunlit shores of a remote mountain lake. Before we step onto those mountain shores, if you appreciate the hours of digging, both in archives and in the ground, that go into uncovering these hidden histories, tap like and subscribe to Stone and Bone. And in the comments, tell us, where do you think the Black Death truly began? For most of recorded history, the origin of the Black Death was guesswork dressed as certainty. Medieval chroniclers offered colorful but conflicting accounts. Some claimed it began in 1346 in the Crimean port of Kaffa during a Mongol siege. Others argued for central China, where plague outbreaks were recorded decades earlier. Still others blamed the mysterious lands of the Eurasian steppe, home to nomadic horsemen and their vast herds. Modern historians tried to match these stories with shipping records, trade routes, and scattered accounts of early outbreaks. But the truth was, without genetic evidence, every theory was circumstantial. The bacterium responsible, Yersinia pestis, mutates so slowly that tracing its ancestry through modern strains was like trying to follow a faint trail across shifting sand. That changed only in the last two decades, as advances in paleogenomics allowed scientists to recover and sequence DNA from victims who died hundreds even thousands of years ago. The race to find the plague's patient zero had begun. The breakthrough came from a field so new it barely existed 20 years ago. Paleogenomics, the study of ancient DNA. Unlike traditional archeology, span which works with artifacts, paleogenomics works with the microscopic genetic code preserved inside bones and teeth. And teeth in particular are a gold mine. Protected by hard enamel, the dental pulp can trap traces of pathogens that once coursed through a person's blood, preserving them for centuries. To find the Black Death's true origin, scientists needed more than historical hunches. They needed genetic proof that could be placed precisely in time and space. By building a genetic family tree of Yersinia pestis from over 1,300 samples, both modern and ancient, researchers could see when different plague strains branched off from their common ancestor. This wasn't just theory. It had been done before. The same methods had traced the evolution of tuberculosis back over 6,000 years and mapped the origins of medieval leprosy outbreaks in Scandinavia. If the right ancient sample could be found for the Black Death, scientists could follow its DNA straight to ground zero. And that's where a forgotten set of bones from the late 1800s entered the story. High in the Tian Shan Mountains of modern-day Kyrgyzstan lies Lake Isikul, a deep sapphire-blue expanse framed by snow-capped peaks. In the 14th century, 
Its northern shores were more than just scenic. They were a strategic stop on the Silk Road, the great trade network linking China, the Middle East, and Europe. One of the small communities here was a Nestorian Christian trading settlement, a cultural crossroads where Persian coins, Indian pearls, and Mediterranean ceramics changed hands. Life revolved around caravans, markets, and the steady flow of goods and ideas across continents. But in 1338 and 1339, something extraordinary and deadly happened. Within two years, the local cemetery saw over 118 burials, an enormous spike for such a small settlement. Many gravestones bore a single word carved in ancient Syriac script, pestilence. In 1886, a team of Russian archaeologists excavated two of these cemeteries near the village of Karajagak. They carefully recorded inscriptions, collected artifacts, and transported skeletal remains to St. Petersburg. Then, the trail went cold. The bones sat in museum storage for more than a century, the mystery of the pestilence unresolved. Those gravestones, silent for centuries, were waiting for science that didn't yet exist. And in the early 2000s, the right historian finally came looking. Enter Philip Slavin, a medieval historian at the University of Stirling in Scotland. While researching the economic and environmental history of the Black Death, he came across the old excavation reports from the year 1886, buried deep in the archives. At first glance, they were just another set of archival records. But the dates, and that word pestilence, jumped out at him. Slavin noticed something unusual. In just two years, the Karajigat community had lost an astonishing one-third of its population. The clustering of deaths, combined with the cemetery's position on a major Silk Road branch, fit a pattern he had seen before in plague-hit regions. Still, a historian's suspicion wasn't enough. Without hard scientific proof, this was only an educated guess. But Slavin knew that the remains, if they still existed, could hold the answer. He contacted the Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography in St. Petersburg, where the skeletons had been stored for over a century. When museum staff confirmed the bones were still intact, the next call went to paleogeneticists at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany. These researchers were already building one of the most comprehensive genetic family trees of Yersinia pestis ever attempted, using over 1,300 plague samples from across history. Slavin's find was exactly the kind of missing link they'd been hoping for. If the DNA in those teeth matched the base of their plague family tree, it could pinpoint the birthplace of the Black Death once and for all. The Max Planckey team began with seven individuals from the Karajigat graves, carefully extracting teeth to reach the dental pulp, the tiny protected space where traces of blood-borne pathogens can survive for centuries. The process required sterile, climate-controlled clean rooms to avoid contamination. When the first results came back, the team knew they'd struck gold. Three of the seven carried unmistakable genetic fragments of Yersinia pestis. This wasn't just circumstantial, it was the smoking gun. But the real revelation came when they sequenced the entire genome of the ancient bacterium and compared it to their global database. It sat right at the root of the plague's evolutionary tree, the original strain from which all later Black Death outbreaks descended. This moment solved a centuries-old puzzle. The Black Death didn't originate in Europe or even along the Black Sea coast. It began in Central Asia, around Lake Isikul, in 1338, a full decade before it tore through the Mediterranean. The genetic data also revealed something extraordinary. This ancestral strain had undergone a big bang of diversification in the early 14th century, splitting into four major lineages. One of those lineages would go on to cause the Black Death in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, lingering for centuries in recurring outbreaks. The next question was no longer where or when it started, but how it made the deadly leap from wild animals to humans, and then crossed thousands of miles to reach Europe. The Lake Isik Kul region isn't just picturesque. 
It's what scientists call a natural plague reservoir. Here, Yersinia pestis circulates quietly among wild rodents such as marmots, great gerbils, and voles. These animals rarely die from the disease, instead acting as long-term hosts, passing it back and forth through flea bites. In most years, the plague stays locked in this hidden animal world. But something in the early 1330s upset the balance. Climate records from tree rings and lake sediments suggest a period of warmer, wetter springs swept across Central Asia. More rain meant more vegetation, more food for rodents, and an explosive population boom. More rodents meant more fleas, and more opportunities for Y. pestis to spill into humans. A single infected marmot, hunted for meat or its prized fur, could have carried enough fleas to infect the first person in the chain. From there, the bacteria could spread through flea bites, contaminated hands during skinning, or even inhalation in rare cases. This process is called zoonotic spillover, when a disease jumps from animals to humans. We've seen it in recent years with Ebola in Africa, which likely spread from bats, SARS in 2002 from civet cats, and COVID-19, which scientists believe may have come from bats. In every case, the pattern is the same. An ecological shift opens a door that should have stayed shut. At Isikul, that door would lead to one of the deadliest chapters in human history. The question was, once it entered humans, how did it travel 3,500 kilometers to the Black Sea? The Karajagak settlement was no isolated mountain hamlet. It sat on a busy branch of the Silk Road, the overland trade network that, at its height, stretched over 8,000 miles from eastern China to the Mediterranean. Every caravan that passed through Lake Isikul carried not just goods, but also stowaways. Archaeologists found pearls from the Indian Ocean, silver coins from Iran, and ceramics from the Mediterranean in the graves proof of far-reaching connections. Traders here were middlemen in a vast exchange, their camel caravans hauling spices, textiles, and precious metals westward. But those same caravans also transported black rats, which thrived in grain sacks and animal fodder. Each rat could carry fleas infected with Yersinia pestis, turning every stop along the route into a new outbreak zone. Unlike a sudden epidemic that burns out quickly, this was a slow-motion spread, moving from oasis to oasis, town to town. By the mid-1340s, the plague had reached the Crimean Peninsula, the critical gateway to Europe. There, in the bustling port city of Kaffa, the next and most infamous chapter of the Black Death would unfold. In 1346, the bustling Genoese-controlled port of Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula came under siege by the Mongol army of the Golden Horde. The Mongols had a problem. Plague was tearing through their own ranks. Soldiers began dying in droves, their bodies bearing the unmistakable swellings and fever of Yersinia pestis. Then came one of the most notorious moments in medieval warfare. Chroniclers like Gabriele de Musi, an Italian notary, recorded that the Mongols used catapults to hurl the corpses of plague victims over Kaffa's walls. Whether this was deliberate biological warfare or simply a grisly attempt to demoralize the defenders, the effect was the same. The plague entered the city. From Kaffa's docks, Genoese merchant ships fled for ports across the Mediterranean, Messina, Genoa, Venice, and beyond. But they carried more than passengers and goods. In the holds, black rats and their fleas made the journey, turning every arrival into a spark that lit new fires of infection. Europe in 1347 was primed for disaster. Crowded medieval cities, poor sanitation, and exploding rat populations created the perfect breeding ground. Within months, the Black Death was sweeping across the continent, killing as much as two-thirds of the population in some cities, according to historian Ole Benedicto. 2021. The immediate toll of the Black Death was staggering, an estimated 75 to 200 million deaths worldwide between 1347 and 1353, according to the World Health Organization, 2020. 
But its ripple effects reshaped societies for centuries to come. Economically, labor shortages upended the feudal order. With so many peasants dead, survivors could demand higher wages and better conditions. In England, this shift fueled the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, one of the first major uprisings against feudal authority. Culturally and religiously, the plague bred both desperation and suspicion. Flagellant movements marched from town to town, whipping themselves to atone for humanity's sins. Minority communities, particularly Jews, faced horrific persecution and mass killings, scapegoated for a disease no one understood. Genetically, the Black Death may have left a lasting mark on human populations. A recent study published in Nature in 2022 by Clunk and colleagues suggests that survivors carried gene variants in their immune systems that helped protect against the plague, but may also make people today more vulnerable to certain autoimmune diseases. Even art and literature bear its scars. The macabre imagery of the danse macabre, the skeletal figure leading rich and poor alike to the grave, became a recurring theme in European culture. Death was no longer an abstract concept. It had walked every street, and all of it began with a quiet mountain community and a single zoonotic leap. The story of the Black Death's origin is more than a solved mystery. It's a warning. The same forces that unleashed Yersinia pestis in the 14th century still exist today. Shifting climates, interconnected trade networks, and pathogens waiting in animal reservoirs. The Isik Kul outbreak shows how a local ecological change, warmer, wetter springs leading to a rodent and flea boom, can ripple outward through global human connections. In a world where goods and people now travel not by camel caravan, but by jet aircraft, the speed of spread is exponentially greater. It also shows the power of interdisciplinary research. Without 19th century archaeology, Slavin's archival detective work, and the precision of modern paleogenomics, this 680-year-old mystery might have remained unsolved. Today, plague is no longer a medieval death sentence. Antibiotics can treat it if caught early, but other diseases, from Ebola to emerging coronaviruses, remain lethal. Understanding the Black Death's true beginnings isn't just history. It's a blueprint for spotting and stopping the next pandemic before it becomes unstoppable. The graves on the northern shore of Lake Isikul hold more than the remains of traders and their families. They hold the opening chapter of a story that would change the fate of continents. A reminder that sometimes, history's biggest turning points begin in the smallest, most isolated of places. So the next time you hear about a new disease spreading across borders, remember, the past has already written this story once before. The only difference now is whether we're paying attention. If this changed the way you see history, or how fragile our world really is, hit like, subscribe to Stone and Bone, and join us as we uncover more buried truths through DNA, ruins, and real research. And in the comments, let us know. Do you think we've truly learned from the Black Death, or are we still just one trade route away from repeating it?